Remember, I'm a VIP, not the man from the Prudential. A man to every sacrifice, I'm eminently priestly. I don't think sacrificing's nice, in fact, I think it's beastly. For what's my line? For what's his line? I can divine. Can he divine? Each mystic sign. Each mystic sign. An omen to. To show men what to do. So treat me most, most respectfully. Be very deferential. I shall and believe you me. Extremely influential.
talking about being irreverential. How many of you have remembered it's the anniversary of Adonis? I thought so. Not one. There was a time when on every special day the courtyard of the temple was absolutely cluttered with offerings. Really good stuff. So much so I could hardly pick my way to the door. And when I did, there was generally a gift herd of goats outside. But nowadays, and a famous, Yes, Great Auger. The inventory of this morning's offerings. Here, yeah, Great Auger. One small turtle, two amphorae of milk, a ram's horn, and some poultry poultry. <laughs> Presida. Yes, Great Auger. How is it you weren't up at dawn bringing a brace of peacocks to the temple? Uh, uh, I had a late night. <laughs> Leona? Modern youth, you wouldn't find Queen Helen neglecting her duties. Poor Helen can't help herself. She has to toe the line. Yes, if she hadn't married old Menelaus, she'd be one of us and enjoying herself. <laughs> There's no doubt about it, Philicomus. Things ain't what they used to be. It's not that I disagree with what those young baggages have to say. It's just that they have the nerve to say it out loud to me. I can't see it matters much. Everybody knows Helen has a pretty thin time with the old man. But she keeps up appearances. She'll be here in time for the Adonis ceremony, you mark my words. And she'll bring a very nice offering too, if only to keep in with Venus. Oh, because of the Mount Ida business. Of course. Venus promised young Paris the love of the most beautiful woman in the world. So naturally, the Queen's been working overtime to make sure he turns up. You can't blame her being married to an old fuddy-duddy like Menelaus. But he is the king, and Helen, being the queen, couldn't possibly, uh, uh, well, could she? Of course she could. Being married to, to Vulcan didn't prevent Venus from having a romance with Adonis, did it? What a pity the poor lad had to go out hunting and get himself killed by a wild boar. Nasty. Venus still hasn't got over it. They say she rushed to her lover's aid in her pretty little bare feet and made them bleed. And the roses she trod on, all white before, became red. <laughs> ah, a much touching legend. <laughs> Hark! There's the overture to Adonis, and here come the mourners. Very effective and dead on time as usual. You've got to hand it to Helen. She knows what time it is.
shall have laid as many as you like after the ceremony. The ceremony can wait. Oh. Speak, great queen. What's up? I keep thinking about that affair on Mount Ida. The three goddesses, the golden apple, and the shepherd. Especially the shepherd. I suppose there's no sign of him. No, not yet, but don't worry. He'll get here. That's why I'm worrying. The reward that Venus promised him. Was it just the love of the fairest of women? That's the official version. No name was mentioned. There was no need. Oh, fairest of women. Hmm. I can see my fatal charm is going to be an embarrassment to me again. It's been getting me into trouble ever since I was 15 when that old Theseus carried me off to Attica. Oh, but you were soon rescued. Not soon enough. After that, I was pestered by every Greek hero in the business. With the result, I got a reputation for being no better than I should be. Remember only that you excite every man to admiration and every woman to envy. I'm not allowed to forget. I could have married any one of a thousand sighing suitors. The whole point of choosing Menelaus, king of Sparta, was to get a little peace and quiet. Well, he's proved humdrum enough, surely. Oh, Calchas, he's the humdrumest thing that ever happened. After all the hectic adventures I've been through, I ought to be thankful. But I'm not. Not a bit. Life gets tedious. And just as I'm making a great effort to put up with it, and to find consolation in being respectable, this has to happen. You're made the fee for judging a beauty contest. It's really too bad of Venus to go promising me to strange young men. Ted, Ted, you mustn't think of it like that, fair queen. Allow me, as your chief auger, to straighten you out on this delicate matter. Can you? Oh, Calchas, you're so good to me. Oh, you're so good to me. I mean, to the temple. Well, to begin with, Venus would hardly have been so well disposed towards this shepherd if she hadn't thought him very personable. So you may be sure your uh, compliance will not be without its compensation. The whole thing's most improper and very unfair on the shepherd. Oh, I no doubt he'll consider it has its compensations too. An intolerable situation. The more I think of it... But I beg the Queen will not say anything hasty. It is the will of Venus. The will of Venus. Fate commands it. Fate commands it. And it must be rather comforting to know that no matter what happens, no blame can possibly be attached to you. Yes, that is comforting. But make no mistake about it, Calchas, I shall be blamed just the same. <laughs> Arrest is the young rip. Uh, may I remind the queen that her ladies are waiting for her in the temple? What's the matter? Do I have to flee at the approach of my nephew? A most irresponsible young man, I'm afraid, especially when in the company of flirtatious young ladies. Not a spark of reverence. Perhaps you should speak to his father about him. Oh, I doubt if I get any change out of King Agamemnon. He's not all that reverent himself these days. No. None of the top people are. It's all right if their plans happen to coincide with the will of the gods, in which case they're most cooperative. Otherwise... Not so good for the augury business, eh, Calchas? If it weren't for your valued support, O oh Queen... Oh, no, you can count on me, as long as the reverse also applies. Well, what could be fairer than that? <laughs> uh, please, they are waiting to begin the ceremony. Perhaps I ought to speak to Orestes. I'd rather you set him an example, O oh Queen. Much more dignified than bandying words. As you wish, Great Augur. Keep a lookout for my handsome shepherd boy, won't you? You bet. Tis Venus's wish that you should meet him, and her wish is my command. Whether her wish is also my command depends on quite a lot of things. We'll see. <laughs> It isn't the mighty organ himself. Calchas, my friend. <laughs> Sir, how are you? Had any good myths lately? <laughs> Prince Orestes. Queen Helen has just this moment entered the temple for the Adonis ceremony, and I beg that you will make no unseemly... Ah, my sainted are the communes with Venus again. Very anxious to keep in with the goddess of love lately, isn't she? We've all noticed it. It's quite remarkable. Well, we were wondering if it could possibly have anything to do with the story that's been going around. A very interesting story. Everybody's heard it. Yes. Ah, there you're wrong, darling. One very important person knows nothing about it. 
fall. Not one word of it has been allowed to reach his royal ears. That's right, Calchas, isn't it? Uh, uh, King Menelaus is very heavily burdened with affairs of state, not to mention the responsibility of entertaining three visiting kings. It has not thought been necessary to involve him in a matter which is mystical rather than political. Oh, very wise, very sensible. We're off keeping the old man in the dark. It'll make things easier all round. It's inappropriate, young man, to speak with levity on matters affecting the deities. Really, I wonder what's happened to good old faith and obedience. I tremble to think of the Olympian wrath that's being conjured up by this irreverent hedonism, this constant concentration on matters of the flesh <laughs> instead of good old faith. I must go and consult the oracle to see whether some conciliatory sacrifice is required to prevent Jupiter from hurling a thunderbolt. You know, um, I get the idea he doesn't approve of us. Typical zealot. His idea of reverence is that nobody ever has any fun. Poor Helen may have to put up with those stodgy old ceremonies, but nobody can stop us from having a good time. <laughs> We're the irreverent pleasure seekers always out for cheese. To be sweet and mild and ever meeker, we'd be born to tears. The calcus held us in his spell, we danced with high propriety. But men like him are also grim and full of phony piety. So, so we prefer our own frivolity. If you or I should ever try to justify our point of view, they'd only sigh and ask us why we like to do the things we do. They're all so square and couldn't bear the thought of daring something new. To them it's strange to want a change, except they haven't got a clue. They've shown us they prefer to stay the same today as us today. So we have shown they made it known we go our own sweet way. We live and make the most of it, enjoy ourselves and boast of it, and strive for notoriety in matters of propriety. Our spirits have compelled us to dismiss some things the zealots do. As too sedate and serious, they irritate and weary us. We think Olympic gods are fine, but even they must be in kind. Let us keep them entertained so they can say it's been ordained. Oh, Calchas says high offices to warn us of the prophecies, but thinks he calls libidinous are really just a kid in us. He says we ought to show respect, but what he never will suspect is we know he's nefarious and find him quite hilarious. We let the critics criticize and even even criticize, no matter how they hammer us, we never get the hammer us. Our lives are just one long romance. We live on love and song and dance. I'll be the chance. We live and the most of it. Enjoy ourselves and most of it. And strive for notoriety and matters of propriety. High spirits, spirits have compelled us to dismiss some things the zealots do. And so much silly fuss, it simply wouldn't do for us. Not for us. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. Not for us. Simple Helen's life is so monotonous. But as we shall away for Queen Helen to be among us. Helen's about you in the sacred ashes and got the answer by gyromancy. I feel a bit dizzy actually. Walking in circles doesn't suit me. And what does your abracadabra tell you about us, great ogre? That the gods do not intend to turn a blind eye on your impieties. I predict they will exert their awesome powers before you know it. I hope so. Don't we, ladies? Definitely. It couldn't be soon enough. I wouldn't be so smug if I was you. I have two further suggestions. First, kindly remember that what Venus told Paris is none of your business. And secondly, kindly disport yourself elsewhere. Queen Helen may wish to speak with me as she leaves the temple. To have you keep an eye open for our wandering shepherd, no doubt. I see. When this fellow does turn up, 
You'll be a sport and introduce me, won't you? I'd like to hear everything about his uh, affair on Mount Ida. Lucky dog. <laughs> Nothing yet, but something soon will be, or I'm no prophet. Prophet? Have I the good fortune of addressing the great Calchas, chief augur of the Temple of Jupiter? You have. My name's Paris. How do you do? Venus sends her kind regards. Venus? Yes. While I was on my way here, one of her carrier doves dropped me a note, saying kind things about you, and advising me to seek your cooperation. Indeed. May I see it? It's with Venus, all right. I recognize the Kithara stamp, I say. May I have it for my collection? By all means. Thank you. Oh, how gratifying that the goddess should recommend me in such flattering terms. You may not be so happy about it when you know the whole story. Oh, I know it already. You do? Yes, I had this arrangement with Mercury. He fills me in on anything special. It will return for a rather swagger ceremony on his feast day. Very useful. Oh, it is very... Well, so you've turned up at last. And quite up to specification, if I may say so. You know, I've been longing to meet you. There are one or two things I'm not quite certain about. This adventure of yours on Mount Ida, just exactly what were you doing there, anyway? That's easy. It was on Mount Ida that I was abandoned as a baby because of an evil prophecy. Now, my birthright's been restored, and I'm my father's son again. But I still escape from court whenever I can to recall the happy days of my youth when I was a shepherd. I see. So it was while you were praying Tron and were dressed in this rustic outfit that you came upon the three goddesses. I say that must have been rather intriguing, what? Mm, yes, uh, indeed. Yes, it's not often given to mortal man to see even one beautiful goddess uh, in the round, as it were, let alone three. <laughs> it was quite an experience. I bet it was. <coughs> Pray, don't consider me vulgarly curious, but would you mind telling me the whole story, just for the record? Not at all. Providing I can set it to music, it's far too romantic to tell in mere prose. Oh, if you insist. T'was just by chance I wandered on Mount Ida, as any shepherd might. And all at once I spied a wondrous sight. I beheld three goddesses, Queen Be Juno, proud Minerva, Venus, fair to see. Which of these three charmers had charms the rarest? Who was fairest they could ne'er agree? Messenger Mercury then announced it was Jove's decree. There should be unanimity. So he appointed me referee. As you can be sure, I was dazed and stood in a dream to contemplate. No man before e'er can have gazed on beauty supreme in triplicate. On Juno first, Minerva next, I feasted my eyes unnerved, perplexed. Then upon Venus let them fall and gave her the prize as fairest of all. Then taking her hand in mine, I sang to that form divine. Oh, enchanting goddess of love, how often you give us mortals a glimpse of heaven above. And a promise was my reward that by the divinest woman on earth I'd be adored. It was my destiny to be loved by a queen who'd be ever famous in history. Fair as a mortal can ever be. Who but Helen pray could it be? Who else could it be? Man, 
I find this absolutely fascinating. You may rely on me to do my best to see that wishes, uh, Venus's wishes are fulfilled. Thank you very much. Not that it'll all be plain sailing. No. No. Uh, to begin with, Helen has a conscience that matches her beauty, and she's under no obligation. She's under the same obligation as I am. If you will accept my advice, you're far more likely to succeed in your purpose by being patient than you are by being aggressive. I was going on to say that my own position, too, is somewhat ticklish. King Menelaus may be a bit of a clot, but he is, after all, the king. He is also by way of being a friend of mine. It does seem rather unkind. My dear Calchas, you'll just have to make up your mind whose side you're on, won't you? No, yeah, but I have. I'm on yours and Helen's. That is to say, I'm on Venus's side. Her wish is my command, and poor old Menelaus will have to lump it. Is it true Queen Helen is really ravishingly beautiful? Oh, she has a face that could launch a thousand ships. Who knows, perhaps one day it will. Psst, great ogre. The ceremony is nearly over. Paris, my boy, you're about to catch your first glimpse of fair Helen. Rest assured that in accordance with the wish of Venus, I shall do my best to make sure that it is not your last. As a matter of fact, I already have a little scheme worked out. Oh, that reminds me, Philokovus? Uh, yes, Great Ogre. Uh, the thunder sheet, has it come back from the blacksmith? It has, Great Ogre. Has I it put been, it inside. Has it been properly fixed? Good as new. Better, in fact. Like to hear it? I'll rattle it for you with pleasure. No, no, no. I don't want Jupiter giving forth now when there's no one to hear it. I'll tell you later. Thunder from Mount Olympus at the appropriate moment is absolutely vital to my little scheme. Now leave everything to me. You will be very discreet at this first meeting with the Queen, won't you? Of course. Just let us set eyes on each other. That's all I ask. But whatever you do, don't tell her who I am yet. <laughs> that I doubt if I shall survive the lightning of your eyes. They say the gods sometimes take on human shape. I'm afraid that I'm just a real ordinary man. Sorry to disappoint you. Oh, you don't disappoint me in the least. On the contrary, I was only afraid you were too good to be true. A mere shepherd. Mere? I never saw anybody less mere in my life. You're quite the most superb young man I ever set eyes on. I must confess I'm at a loss. I expected you to be furious with me for speaking without being spoken to, and to ask how I dare to kiss your hand. Oh, there wouldn't have been much point in that. But such impertinence on my part calls for an explanation, surely. And I have a very good one already. It's really not necessary. If you're not some deity playing a trick on me, then I know exactly who you are and what you've come for. You do? And now, of course, I'm in the most awful predicament. Why? Because I had made up my mind to say exactly what I thought about the whole affair. To be highly indignant and scandalized. That's how you feel about it. Well, that's how I felt I ought to feel about it. And now that's how you feel you needn't feel about it? When I look at you, I just don't know. Calca says Venus wills it. Venus certainly wills it. Fate commands it. Fate certainly commands and it. And he's all for it. Oh, yes, Calchas is all for it. Well, that's all very well, but what's he doing about it? Forgive me, O oh Queen. Sir, your pardon. I wouldn't have interrupted for the world, but from my observatory, I've seen the royal retinue approaching. King Menelaus. Yes, and his three guests. As, as if one king wasn't enough at the moment, we've got a quartet of them. Just imagine the strain. Calchas, I must speak to you. Uh, fair Queen, in a moment, this place will be thronged with people, and I must be here to greet the kings. Pray, return to my sanctum. By the time it's necessary for you to appear, there's plenty of time for Philocomus to explain a certain little plan of mine. Please, hurry, there's little time. May I escort you? Philocomus, don't forget. Wait for the queue. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ajax roar, wonderful Ajax, marvelous Ajax, glorious Ajax, I'm so gratified. And I hear Hail Menelaus, good Menelaus, nice Menelaus, I blush pink with pride. We're proud that our praises are what people like to sing. We don't on cause to acclaim us, lovely, famous, well, can you blame us? It's a splendid thing to be a Grecian king. Turn that one praise and people sing to the window. Brave Agamemnon, great Agamemnon, grand Agamemnon, fly, go story on. Oh, they could and if he tries. When fans yell, fearless Achilles, gallant Achilles, gorgeous Achilles, I feel fortified. It takes it in his life. When we issue orders to attention, people spring. At great expense, they afford us rich in New Orleans, cheer and afford us. It's a splendid thing to be a Grecian king. He's got them all, and he's so strange to attention, he can make them sweet. And, uh, what are the augurs for today? Oh, good, King Menelaus. I divine from the flight of doves over the Dar al Hanan this morning that it's going to be a very interesting day uh, for the Queen. But, judging by the mingling of Isuzus and Daihatsus on the Palestine flyover, I regret it's likely to be a rather miserable one for you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. But Menelaus, just how good is old Calchas at this augury business anyway? Oh, very good indeed, very good. A trifle confusing at times, but a very soothing soothsayer. Mm, it's easy for you to say. Soothsayer, my foot. I wouldn't trust him farther than I could throw it. <laughs> oh, but that would be quite a long way. I've seen you throw the discus. Say, did I tell you how I set a new world record for the javelin last month? I'm sure we've all heard it at least once. At the moment, we're looking for something new to entertain us. Yes, as you see, Calchas, my royal guests are a teeny bit tetchy. I'm at moments end trying to amuse them. Can't you conjure up any suggestions? I regret, great king, that the rigors of the soothsaying business leave let very little time for considerations of amusement and sport. Why, why did I have to get a wizard to his old business? Oh, maybe a race would be fun. Tell me, how far is it to marathon? Queen Helen of Sparta. Oh. My dear, just finished your sighing and mourning. The mourning's not over yet. <laughs> really? Oh. Well, the ceremony seems to have agreed with you. You're looking positively radiant. And what have you been doing? Passing the time. Oh. Wondering how to pass the time. King Menelaus seems to have run out of ideas. It's true, Helen. I've tried every contest I can think of. We played bull, we played bingo, we played skittles. We... Hey, how about another chariot race? Yeah, or we could throw Toyotas. Why don't you two throw each other? Silence, son. <laughs> Sorry, Cosmic. I was only trying to bring up. In my opinion, men are far too interested in purely physical amusements. Muscular exercise is all very well, but a few mental gymnastics now and then wouldn't do any harm. Mental gymnastics? You mean uh, using our uh, brains? You, Achilles, perform great feats with your bow and arrow. And you, Ajax, can do great acts of weightlifting. You both have muscles of iron, but your IQs. She, she accuses of something. something. Fair Helen is right. Brawn has become an obsession. Brain is at a discount. Now, wait a minute, Agamemnon. Are you trying to tell us that we need aerobics for our heads? <laughs> yeah, just because we're strong doesn't mean we can't be clever with it. Alas, great heroes, I doubt if you could pass even the simplest intelligence test. By Jupiter, I think she's got it. By Jove, she's got it. Oh, my dear. 
you have managed to provoke our royal guests into agreeing to attempt some pastimes which aren't completely witless, if we can think of any. If I were you, I'd start with something quite juvenile, or they might be discouraged. For a start, why don't you, for example, ask them a riddle? A riddle! A riddle. Why not make it a competition? Open to everybody. Kings, princes, warriors, citizens, shepherds. What a good idea. Clever little girl. To inaugurate a new golden age of intellectual achievement, I, King Menelaus I of Sparta, hereby offer the prize of a laurel wreath to be presented to whomsoever can give the right answer to the riddle about to be propounded. Hey. Hey. Anyone know any riddles? Uh, great king, I believe I might render assistance with one. One? A wizard on your salary ought to be able to provide sufficient for a whole series of half-hour programs. <laughs> Never mind. One will do for the moment. It's so very simple, so childishly easy to guess that I wonder whether our distinguished guests might not be insulted. <laughs> Could be. On the other hand, you may be overestimating our powers of deduction. <laughs> so never mind, let's hear the riddle. The prey sirens for Calchas, the auger. <coughs> what is it that has got 32 ivory walls, two bridges that go nowhere, and is always out at night? <coughs> That's done it. The golden age may have to be postponed. <laughs> Ivory Wars. Sounds like one of the new Cornish palaces. Yeah, and the, and the Cornish has plenty of bridges that go nowhere. And roundabouts, too. Is this thing fact or fiction? Fact. Oh. It's got to be the Cornish. I've been out there at night, and everybody is always out. I suppose, Great Augur, that there is an answer to your conundrum. Oh, yes, Great King. Oh. And what happens if we have to give it up? Not a good omen for the Golden Age, I fear. Excuse me, you did say this was an open competition. I certainly, and I stick by it. But you don't think, do you, young man, that in a contest of wits, a humble shepherd could succeed where crowned heads have failed? We'll find out if you'll give the fellow a chance. Don't be put off, young man, shepherd or king. <laughs> Best man wins. Fire away. Oh, well then, fire away. I suppose I'm asking for trouble, but do tell us, what has 32 ivory walls? Two bridges that go nowhere. And, and is always out at night. A set of false teeth. <laughs> well, why didn't you get that? Well, why didn't you? Besides, I've still got my own. <laughs> that does it. I've had enough. I don't need to stand here and be humiliated yeah, by a... Humiliated by a highbrow, low-born shepherd. Let's leave. Hey, gentlemen, Sparta is honored by your presence and is confident that such noble heroes will not take offense at the outcome of a mere game. If it is any consolation to you, you have not been outwitted by a low-born shepherd. This rustic apparel is only a disguise. May I introduce myself? My name is Paris, son of Priam, the king of Troy. Direct from his great success on Mount Ida. Quiet boy. Been <laughs> touring, have you? Oh, I'm sure you'll find something to amuse you during your stay in Sparta. Well, 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 who'd have thought it? Here we were all thinking that you were a humble shepherd and all the time you were Paris, prince of Troy. What a turn up for the Iliad. <laughs> From the start, I thought how well he plays the part. Son of Priam, and yet I am just a shepherd still at heart. Paris! Your Highness, I am Menelaus. Don't make us better or delay us. In spite of his disguise, a normal rule of lies is entitled to. 
and crown the youth my treasure. With the greatest of pleasure. Congratulate the winner and hope he will join us at dinner at 7.30. Don't be late. It is the hand of fate and it's decreed So far so good, we've done you proud. But two is company and three an awful crowd. I quite agree, but dare not say it now. Suppose the king had to obey a message sending him away. That's what I had in mind. You're really very kind. Joe will speak without Great. 